So welcome to the simulated Yom Kippur Day service, where Zalman and I are going to run through the entire morning service. So that's the Shachris and the Musaf and the, the Avodah. And that is the morning service and the Musaf, but also that includes the whole temple service. And um, like we've done with the Rosh Hashanah recording and the, the Yom Kippur evening simulated service, we're not doing a whole prayer, but we are running through the whole machzor, and we're going to try to make sure we not only sing all the key songs um, that you've come to know from us, but also... And love. <laughs> very much so, and love. <laughs> but also um, uh, give you all the deeper commentary and meaning, so that when you go through the machzor yourself, you'll have our voices ringing in the background as you do so on Yom Kippur Day. And you remember these ideas so that the, the, the readings on your own are actually quite deep and profound. Well, I'm hoping to achieve that. So if you've got a red spirit grow machso, we're on page 115. And whatever machso you've got, look in the index for the morning service. And like on Rosh Hashanah, there might be a slight difference just with the opening prayers. Um, because the Ashkenazi Nusach might start with Baruch Sha'omar and the Sfari Nusach We'll start with a different paragraph later. We follow the Sfadi tradition, which is uh, closer to the, the, the mystics Siddur. And besides that, there won't be too much uh, change. Although later in the service, uh, the Ashkenazi Machsor have some hundreds of pages more uh, of uh, content than the one that we use. We haven't chosen the shorter one. We've just followed a tradition that doesn't include a lot of that extra poetry in the service. So if you do find that your index goes longer than what we're doing, we haven't abridged or, or cut anything out. It's just that there are slightly, well, more than slightly different nuschat, different versions of what poetry gets included. But the main part of the service is exactly the same. So 115. <laughs> Hoi di ova mi mali loi sav. And uh, that paragraph finishes with the famous Ashria Om, which is famous for its tune. I'll let Zalman just take us out before we move to the next part of the service. Ashria Om shekach aloi, Ashria Yavam shashem elayov. Vani bechas da chavatach di yogel bi bishu asecha Hoshiro la Hashem ki gamal alay I always encourage everyone to stand for the bold words at the bottom of 117. This is the paragraph, it's a very short paragraph, it's only two and a half lines, where it says Hashem is past, present and future. And that's all at the same time. So if we think about Hashem, a particular aspect of Hashem, uh, imagine time as a linear spectrum and then there is the observation of each point on that spectrum all at the same time the observing past present and future all at the same time and then where vision is the observer we're going to insert consciousness and participation so Hashem is not just an outside observer but fully immersed and is the past present and future Adinai Melech, Adinai Melech, Adinai Melech, Adinai Melech, Adinai Melech, Adinai Melech, Adinai Adinai Melech, 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 Adinai and they help the reader um, have a relationship with Hashem where there's this sense of belief of Hashem's presence in our life and therefore a sense of comfort. And that allows us to relax into the Yom Kippur or any Shabbos. This is quite similar to any Shabbos davening. We can relax into the moment knowing that Hashem is fully present with us and, and escorting us and walking with us in every step of our lives. And we then conclude that part with the with a song that we sing every week at Spirit Grove, which starts with the words, um, Praise is Hashem because He's good. And uh, may that kindness be everlasting. So what we're saying on this Yom Kippur morning is that whatever happens in our life, Hashem is ultimately executing as an act of kindness. And not always do we 
realize that kindness. Not always do we uh, um, appreciate it. Uh, not that we're not appreciative, but it's sometimes hard to understand how difficult moments can be kind. But I ask you to think about longer journeys of our people, uh, the, the, the long history of the Jewish people, or even in your own life where there were interesting twists and turns that ultimately led to some pretty incredible positive outcomes. And so um, this paragraph actually transcends some thousand years of historical moments, and we actually can see that the twists and turns that is life are actually very carefully orchestrated by Hashem to, to end with a particular result. And we give thanks that the result is ultimately always positive. If I had to conclude with a thought from Rav Nachman of Breslov, um, where he shared with his students that if uh, um, things are no good and you can't see the light, uh, sorry, if things are no good, it's like you're heading through the tunnel and you can't see the light. It just means you haven't reached the end of the process. Mm. Um, the end will always be sweet and always be good. <laughs> should we sing a bit of our other tune that we like to sing? Yeah, maybe we'll finish off. Venosanatsam le nachala ki le yailam khastoi nachla yisrael avdoi ki le yailam khastoi shev shvileinu zochalonu ki le yailam khastoi vayivrekeinu mitzoreinu and that poem is always uh, um, uh, dovetailed with Har Joseph Amunah, which is going to come up again later in the service. So we'll just sing a bit of it now. This is the one that we do sing later in the service on Yom Kippur at Spirit Grow to the tune of the French National Anthem. But we'll just do a bit of the classic Spirit Grow tune that we sing every Shabbat morning on 125. <laughs> Now I know Daniel, you'll be watching this and you'll definitely prefer the second. You don't like when we uh, follow that tradition of, of weaving other less traditional tunes in. So that, that second one was mainly for you. But we're now on uh, 125 and that's where we actually do Baruch Shoma and we hold the corners of our tzitzit. And uh, this is the declaration, that the whole purpose of Judaism is to bind the masculine and feminine energies, is to bind heaven and earth, it's to bind the spiritual and the material, and to create 
not a clash, but actually a full integration until they become one. And we think about the name of God as being both masculine and feminine. Yud is masculine, He is feminine. Yud represents seminal omission, and He represents pregnancy. Vav represents uh, um, the, the, the channeling of something, and the, the mes- masculine member. And then He represents uh, um, development and, and the space in which creation takes place, which is a feminine concept. And so we've got the Yud and the He and the Vav and the He coming together. And so we've got this beautiful dance, which is quite Kabbalistic in its understanding. But uh, um, you think about life, we're taking wool and we're taking the talit and we take food and we take objects. And these are physical objects that we then integrate with spiritual intention. And that is what being Jewish is all about. And with that, there is the saying of Baruch Sha'amar Vahayah Olam, which is, blessed is the one that spoke and the world came to be. And once again, we've got the spiritual intention of God, the Creator, and the physical world, which is creation. And so we've got, once again, this merger of creator and creation. There are a few paragraphs there after the Baruch Shama, which always bring us to Ashrei, Yosh Vevesecha, happy are those who dwell in your house. And not only is it happy are those who dwell in the house, but this is a call by the prayers for us to become settled, to settle into our space. This is a sacred space. Wherever we are is a sacred space. And when we're davening, we create this sacred aura around us. So join Zaman and I for the singing of Ashrei. Ashre Yoshve Vesecha, Ashre Om Shekahaloi, Ashre Om Shaja Melekav, Tila Lila Vida, Ramim Halaya Melech, Vavar Hashim Halaya Lambad, Vechal Yai Mavacheka, Valla Shim Halaya Lambad, Kadala de Nayamul on my yard, Velik Dola Sayah in Heke, Dorla Dori Shabach Masaha. Thank <laughs> you. We move through the next few pages and the davening transitions into uh, um, realizing the Hashemness in all of nature. And uh, we're in a particular situation where the focus on medicine is uh, one of, of very keen public interest. And if you think about illness, illness is a product of nature. Illness is ultimately germs or virus. These are very real measurable um, aspects to the world around us. And the cure also comes from nature. Within nature, there'll be substances and, and, and minerals and and uh, um, when they come together in a particular way, they may actually help preserve life and combat illness. And so we think about the whole cycle of illness and cure. It all exists within nature. Nature is filled with the incredible magic of life. And so as we see the puzzle pieces of nature fit together, we begin to discover Hashem. And the poets in the book of Psalms, the book of Tehillim, they would look at this and they wouldn't just say, oh, that's cool. They'd actually say, well, I've identified Hashem. I've, I've identified the divine intellect that exists within everything. 
and not only the divine intellect within everything, but they took it to the next level where they realized that this has been deliberately designed in this way and is constantly evolving with a, with a deliberate intention from Hashem. And so therefore, the constant evolution of the planet, the evolution of nature, the evolution of life, the growth and the death and the subsequent growth again, these are not by chance, but actually this is Hashem expressing Himself in this world. And therefore they'd cry out, Hallelujah, praises Hashem. And so mm. you might just want to take a moment just to identify just one cycle in nature, whether it's a weather cycle or it's a, a seasonal cycle or a crop cycle or a, um, something closer to home, the, the cycle of life, and just observe in your mind that process and how actually there is, there is a before, middle and after. There is a growth and there is the dying and then there is rebirth. And that this is Hashem expressing the creative energy, the infinite energy within nature itself. Hallelujah. And you can pause and dwell on that idea. Or you can move beyond. We're going to carry on the, the readings through page 131, 32, and 33. All really move into the miraculous uh, uh, um, aspects of nature like the sea splitting and the covenant that Hashem makes with Abraham that his descendants would continue to exist. And you think about the Jewish people existing some uh, 3,500 years, 3,600 years since Abraham and we're still around. Uh, there is no people who have such an ancient uh, um, origin and have traveled the world and been moved around the world and persecuted and are still here and culturally very, very rich. Uh, and very much in touch with um, our heritage. I mean, if, if Jews today met a Jew from the temple period, there'd be some differences and there might be a bit of a language barrier and definitely a, a fashion difference. But by and large, we'd be able to break bread and spend Shabbos with them and not feel too foreign by what they're doing and they wouldn't feel uncomfortable being around us. Uh, we'd eat food and they'd eat food and you could trust that they were kosher and they would be able to trust us that we're kosher. So... Um, just think about that, and that, that commitment is beyond just the splitting of the sea. That commitment of Hashem to allow the Jewish people to continue is in itself quite a miracle. And that part of the service comes to an end. We've, we've thought about nature, we've thought about Hashem in context of time and space, and now we move to Hashem being the master, the king, sitting on the throne today's Yom Kippur, and uh, Hashem now uh, um, takes judgment and takes stock. Is the world the world that Hashem wants it to be. Should the world continue to exist? Not should we have floods or anything like that. Of course there's that. But should we even continue to exist? Should the thought, which has manifest into a reality, return back to just being a thought? And that brings us to page 135, where Zalman introduces the king with the word Hamelech. <laughs>
the next couple paragraphs are no different to any other Shabbos. Um, and while there's different tune, this is very much about the exaltation of Hashem's name. It's the recognition that there is a God and, there, and, and Hashem is infinite. We don't even relate to that. But a name is something that we can build a relationship with. It's like, you know my name, you can build a relationship with me. But it doesn't mean you know me, but at least you've got an entry point, a connection point. And that's what's interesting about this part of the service is it really describes Hashem as the name. And this part finishes with a cry um, from the book of Tehillim where the poet says, A song of a sense, Out of the depths I call to you, O Lord. My Lord, hearken to my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas. And if I were to borrow some of the ideas that I shared in the evening service, in order for Hashem to hear the voice, the voice has to be put out there. And we say, Hashem, that it's from my depths. And so with the Yom Kippur service, it's very important that you not get too lost in trying to read all the Hebrew, if that's going to come at a cost of actually putting what it is that you really want to put in front of the master mm. of, of the universe. I mean, let it come from the depths. This is very shofaric. It's like the shofar comes from deep within. But now we are the shofar. We're not using a shofar. We are the shofar. It's our words. Now, because um, today is... Uh, well, Yom Kippur is on a, a Thursday and not a Shabbos. There's a slight change to how the machzo gets used. There's a, there are Shabbos parts at this point of the service that get skipped. And instead we read what is more relevant to the weekday. And the reason for this difference is because the way Hashem flows into the world on Shabbos and the way Hashem flows into the world during the week is different. It's like having light, which is the metaphor that the service now picks up with, that the, that the machzo picks up with. It's having light go through um, a prism. Or, or a film of some sort, a filter. Um, and so you can end up with different types of light depending on the filter. And then you can also have different source of, sources of light. So LED light is going to be different to a halogen light, which is going to be different to uh, um, firelight. And so literally it's not just that Shabbos and the week are different filters, but actually the origin of the light is different. And therefore there are different prayers that describe Hashem's energy radiating into the world. We move into, while we're talking about radiation, the sections that talk about the angels. And the angels are merely uh, radiant entities, much like light is a wave or a particle that's an, an emission from the sun or any source of light. So when we think about angels in this part of the service, we're not talking about how great angels are or how powerful angels are because they don't contain any power in Judaism, but rather how humble they are, that they are light itself and yet, they have no ego. You'll never meet a ray of light that says, my name is light. If you, meet, if you met a ray of light, it would say, hello, I'm from the sun. Do you want to meet the sun? It would just take you right back to its source. It doesn't exist into itself. And we mentioned the angels in that context because the, the animal uh, um, soul that we all have is competitive soul. And when it hears that angels are actually able to attain a form of ego abnegation, then even our very ego itself mm. wants to achieve abnegation. And that's an interesting idea right before the Shema. So we come to the bold words on page 140. Uh, this, we introduce the angels and then the cry of the angels, which is their, their cry of humility. Zaman will pick us up from V'chulam. וכולם מקבלים עליהם עול מלכו שמיים זה מזה ונועץ נביא יעבור רשות זה לא זה להקדיש ליום ובואי צרם בנחס רוח בצפה ורורה ובנימה כדושה כולם כאחד עיני ביהימה ויוי מרים ויירא. קדש, 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 עדיני צבא אוס, מלך על הארץ כבידה. ויפנים וחיו עיס הקודש, ברעש קדוב עול מסנסים לעומס השרופים. ליום עשה משבחים ויוי מרים ברוך אבי דד עיני מימכה ימה ברוך אבי דד עיני מימכה ימה We always sing this piece in, in spirit grow לקל ברוך נעים עשיתנו למלך אל חי וקיים 
The final blessing before the Shema um, brings us to a, a point of consciousness which well, hopefully we'll attain that, that, that the Shema really is a prayer of oneness. And that when we say one, we don't mean one like the whole body is one of many par- made up of many parts, but rather a true oneness. And so if I had to use um, the concept of creation of light uh, as our basis for today's meditation before the Shema, think about light. What I said before, light is an expression of, it's an emanation of an emanator, of a source. And every aspect of light is surrounded by light. And the light is completely dependent on the source of light. Without, if the source would turn off, then the light would cease to be. So light has everything to be humble about. It's surrounded by light. Um, it, is, it is nothing. And it is completely dependent on its source. And should the source switch off, the light ceases to be. But by now you've already forgotten what I said maybe a couple of minutes ago, the creation of light. The source of light, if you think about it, even the source of light, you have pictured some sort of light source, a sun or a light bulb in your mind. And you're thinking about the light that comes from there. But the light source itself is a creation of your mind. So if the divine consciousness would cease to think about the light, then not only will there not be any light being expressed, there will be no light source. And so even the light source is an expression of something greater. So when we say, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Lekein, Hashem Echad, Hashem is one, we don't just mean one like light is one with its source. We don't even mean like the source of light is one with the consciousness that conjures it up. We mean a form of oneness that is built on these principles, but so much more pure than anything that I could say. And so while we can't intellectually um, get there, through a bit of meditation, we can emotionally um, move into that realm. So close your eyes. And let's just walk through what I've just said. Take a deep breath in. Relax. We're thinking about the creation of light. You have light that is an emanation from a light source. If the light source would switch off, and just picture that in your mind, then the rays of light would cease to shine. Shining is dependent on a light source emanating. You can picture the ray of light in your mind as it is emitted from the source. But this whole image of light is completely dependent on you thinking about it in this moment. If you would stop thinking about it, the light would disappear, as would the powerful light source. The concept of light is rooted within our mind. And the concept is rooted in something higher, as we are. And this goes on infinitely. And so in this moment, we don't try to dissect the infinite layers of oneness, 
but rather the single oneness of which light, source of light, and the source of the origin of light are all one, united in a single entity, Hashem. Take a deep breath in and join Zawin and myself for the Shema. Shema Yisrael So we said the Baruch Shem Kavod Machsol Olam Vayed out loud, which is very unlike the rest of the year, because that is a line that normally we do in a hushed undertone out of respect for it. But on Yom Kippur, we all have that angelic uh, um, level. We're, we're, that's why we dress in white and, and kittles or whatever white garments you're going to wear for your Yom Kippur. And by declaring it out loud, uh, if we had to tie that back to the meditation, the commentary before the meditation, what we're saying is, Baruch Hashem, Kavoy Machsol Vayed, we do that out loud in a, in a way to demonstrate that we are at a level on Yom Kippur. Each one of us is at a level that we have the capacity to actually comprehend, to visually experience the idea of oneness that we meditated on. And although I'm struggling to truly see it and understand it um, with my cognitive ability, um, I have the soul that is able to achieve that. And hopefully over the course of this year, I'll be blessed, as we sh- all will be blessed, hopefully, to, to see that oneness in creation. Amen. So Shema finishes and uh, transitions into the Amidah. And the final song before the Amidah is Shira Hadasha. And this is the second Amidah of Yom Kippur. And I spoke in the earlier recording about um, each of the services, each of the Amidahs, each of the uh, um, uh, um, Amidahs corresponding to one of the levels of soul. So this is the second meaning that it corresponds to the level of Ruach, which is the part of our soul that emotionally animates us or animates our emotional capacity. And so when we bang our chest during this Amidah, and we say, for the things that I've done wrong, we're thinking about what is it that on an emotional level we've done wrong? What are some of the areas that we need to grow and improve and, and, and return on an emotional level so that we are closer to our more pure versions of self? Um, uh, um, think about children. Little children have very, very pure emotions. That doesn't mean they don't express them, but there's something very pure about them that really catches our attention. So what we want to do is return to that in a childlike um, purity with our emotionals, with our emotions. So we'll sing the bottom of Shir Hadasha and then we're going to leave you for the silent Amida. Shir Hadasha, Shir Chogiyulim, Leshim Chagadalas Fasayam, Yachat Kulam, Go, I'll lay no, I'll 
first steps of the Amidah and you bend your knees on Baruch and you bow for Atah and you stand up for Adonai, you are channeling the energy, the energy of Hashem. And so what we're channeling is the, is the energy of Hashem required to be able to improve on an emotional level. And so if you want, you can just close your eyes and what is a color that you would associate with emotional improvement? And as you say those first three words, just imagine the flow of that color and that energy coming into yourself. Of course, it takes a while to read the silent Amida, and we're not doing the whole davening together. We're not davening live. Um, and uh, um, we, let's move over to the repetition of the Amida, where Zaman would normally have guided us. And so today, I'm going to ask Zaman to guide us through the different songs that we like to sing, and I'll throw a f- bit of uh, um, commentary about, just to explain what some of these songs are about and some of the primary paragraphs that we're reading. So Zalman's going to bring us to the page number. If you look <coughs> down your index, you'll find the repetition of the Amidah, the Chazan's Amidah, or something like that. Um, we're moving to which paragraph first? We're going to start, Zalman's going to give us a bit of a rendition of the introduction. The introduction. To, yeah, we've got to do it. It's got such beauty um, to it. So that's 156 in the Spirit Romach song. Hi da 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 ya Hashem Continue, I think. 
Chalkel Chayim Bechesed Mechayim Meisim Ha-Berachamim Rabim So there's a series of responsive uh, paragraphs here, but Zav, where would you like us to pick up next? What, what, where, where do we have a familiar tune? Well, we have one here right after that, actually. With Atto Elekeinu. That's a nice one. We do so if you're looking at like your index, it's <coughs> Atahu, and in the Spirit Grow Machzor, it's page 159. And we um, we sometimes do do it at the with the same tune, the Jerusalem of Gold. Yeah, but we also have. Um, and we did that on Ro- for the Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah one. So, so we can we could do that, but we have another option as well that we do some years. Let's do let's do the other. That way, people can go back to the Rosh Hashanah one if they want this tune. Don't worry, it's still a nice old Israeli song. It's on our YouTube channel. Uh, we've got a few of the classic songs of Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur's, but Zalman's going to guide us through this Yom Kippur's version. Okay. Atahu Eloikenu Bashamayimu Vawaret Gibor Venarot Dagul Mervava Husach Vayehi Vesiva Vnivrahu Zichral Anetzach Chai olamim tehor enayim Yoshev eseser Ki Yisro Yeshua Levusho It's Al Kalele is uh, it's a very nostalgic piece, and it's appropriate because the next dozen pages are very very nostalgic. Um, they reference all sorts of original ideas that led to creation, and uh, and uh, and very much Hashem is the divine uh, benefactor and the divine giver, and us uh, really asking Hashem to forgive us if the plan of creation has not quite gone the way it was meant to. Meaning that uh, um, 
as human beings, we have conscious ability to make free and, and, and free choice. And uh, we are divine partners. And Hashem's created a beautiful world for us to exist. And of course, us as well. Um, and wants us to make the choice to be a partner and to be spiritually um, conscious. And not always is that actually the case. And so we've got these paragraphs of um, this is the word of Hashem and Masa Lekeno, this is the work of Hashem. Uh, we've got the word of Hashem and the work of Hashem. And uh, uh, both of these really are focusing on what is the word of Hashem. So we know that if you look in Genesis, in Beratius, it's and Hashem spoke and it came to be. And we also describe the world not only as the word of Hashem, but actually this is Hashem's work. So we've got the word leading to existence and we've got the formation of the world as a, as a form, as, as a, um, a product. And so we uh, think about these sorts of original ideas of existence in order to um, spur us to think, well, what is our role in all of this? There's a, uh, um, a, a series of these paragraphs which get lost, especially in the English translation. They all follow the Hebrew alphabet. So each line will follow the next letter. And uh, um, uh, the, one, of the, one of the ideas that I shared in the Rosh Hashanah theme is that we've got the, the, the uh, following the alphabet actually creates a certain tikkun, a certain order of A comes before B, which comes before C, or Aleph comes before base, before Gimel, before Dalit. And we draw down the Aleph energy and then the base energy and the Gimel energy, and we've aligned the energies of the world over the course of the prayers of Yom Kippur. Hmm. Where would you like us to pick up? On Hadras Vimunah? Yeah, I mean... Um the Al Yisrael Lemonato is a paragraph that we, we chant all, together. We do. Let's let's do it. Let's do it. And I know um, Hannah. Um, I always hear her uh, when we do this. She's always just that little bit louder than everyone else. And and I kind of feel like if we do it, I'll I'll hear Hannah in in my non-existent earpiece. Let's do it. Al Yisrael Lemonato. Al Yisrael Birchato. Al Yisrael Gavato. Al Yisrael Dibrato. Al Yisrael Hadrato, Al Yisrael Veidato, Al Yisrael Zichrato, Al Yisrael Chemlato, Al Yisrael Taharato, Al Yisrael Yishrato, Al Yisrael Kanato, Al Yisrael Luumato, Al Yisrael Malchuto, Al Yisrael Neimato, Al Yisrael Segulato, Al Yisrael Adato, Al Yisrael Peulato. Al Yisrael Tzidkato, Al Yisrael Kedushato, Al Yisrael Romermuto, Al Yisrael Shechinato, Al Yisrael Tifato. And that's the bottom of 169. We now move on to the top of page 170, Haderes Felmuna, which should be in most uh, um, uh, Machzor indexes. And this is the one that we sang earlier. We sang two different tunes right at the beginning of the service, and we did sing it to the French uh, national anthem, as well as to the more classic uh, um, nigun that we like to sing here at Spirit Grove. And again, the incorporating of the French anthem was very much a Hasidic hat tip to elevating all that is physical in this world. So let's uh, uh, move to the bottom of 170 where we've got Lakel Erech Din. Is there a particular tune that we sing for that at Spirit Grove? Um, we've actually done that as well with um, Jerusalem of Gold on the years that we, because we alternate the song, so the years that we don't do the beginning part, that's a, a, another catchy one. So let's, um, let's, let's do that. Let's do a bit of Jerusalem go, of Gold. Yeah, and Yishlam you'll, see, you'll, you'll see our tricks. A lot of these things work quite well with these, uh, I think they're maybe four standard that's songs. That's right, that's right. Or something of that, of that like. All right, let's go. Levoichen levavos beyavavavavim din legai lemukavos badin legai vemisharim. Can we can we switch it? For sure. Let's As you it. can see, that, that a lot of these uh, very um, similar poems, and that's because the the poets that wrote these pa paragraphs were all musically endowed. They've all uh, followed <laughs> some principles around poetry and music. It's not uncommon. You go into the uh, early 1400s, 1500s, 1600s, and you'll find that there's a lot of poetry, and a lot of music that dovetails with spirituality and, and prayer writing. So. <laughs> Let all the men shine in the morning. 
Leogedeus Badin, Levasig Vyosechesed, Beondin, Lezacher Briso Badin, Lechoimel Masov, Beondin, Let's <laughs> It's at this point that actually um, the Chazan's Amidah takes over and Zalman would actually um, read the next half dozen pages and then we'd get to the end of the, the repetition of the Amidah which for us is on page 175, uh, where that final part once again moves back into that whole conversation around confession and, and thinking about uh, um, areas of improvement and growth and acknowledging the things that we haven't done right. And so there's this riff of Chatonot Tzorena Slachlon Yitzrena, we have sinned, our rock, pardon us, our creator. And it's very harsh. Chatonot Tzorena, we have sinned. Uh, often those words are very, they feel very foreign, we've sinned, very, very religious. But, you know, sometimes saying that really forces us to think about what these words mean. Um, words that aren't comfortable to be spoken, um, what's, what's powerful about them is that they actually generate thoughts. Clichés don't. So saying, we've sinned, okay, sin, it's not a word that we use um, frequently in, in, in the English language or conversationally. So what is it that we are saying when we say those words. And that paragraph finishes with Tevienul Hakotchecha. Once again, as we did last night on the on the evening service, we um, we think about that where would we like to be? We'd like to be on Temple Mount. We'd like to be together. We'd like to be in the house of Hashem. We'd like to be living in a world that is of perfect completion. And so through going through that personal development and social development, we will actually get there. If you look in the writings of the prophets, the Nevi'im of Jewish history in the post-Mosaic uh, period, it goes right through the whole first temporal period. So we're talking about from, you know, from 3,200 years ago all the way through to 2,500 years ago. What is the consistent message that the prophets keep reiterating? Keep reiterating. And ironically, Isaiah says, I don't need your prayers. I don't need your sacrifices. I just want stoka or mishpat. I want kindness and justice. Social justice and a kind of benevolent society, that is what's going to bring us to the temple once again. So all the spirituality that we practice must be accompanied by random acts of kindness and deliberate acts of kindness. And in a society that actually cares for itself. The 
Arna Kodesh doors would be pushed open at this point for the Shema Kalein. Hashem, hear our voice. Hear our voice. Give us the capacity. What is it that you want Hashem to give you? What is it that Hashem um, um, should provide you with so that you can fulfill your part of the deal to be more charitable, to be able to be, uh, um, help create a, a socially just society? What is it that helps us be true partners with Hashem? That's where we say, Shema Kalein, hear our voice. Hear my cry. Hear my request. What is it that I'm asking to... to, to to, to have is your input, Hashem, so that I can be a partner in your great creation. Shema Kaleinu Hashem Eloikeinu Chuz Urachim Olev Eveinu V'kabel V'rachamim V'ratso Inest V'losenu Shema Kaleinu Hashem Eloikeinu Chuz Urachim Oleinu V'kabel V'rachim Oratso Inest V'losenu Hashem Eloikeinu Hashem Eloikeinu Hashivenu Hashem Eilecha V'nashuva Chadesh Yameinu Kekedem Al Tashlechenu Milvonecha V'ruach Chachecha Al Tikach Al Tashlechenu Milvonecha V'ruach Chachecha Al Tikach Mimenu and of course that sort of crying out uh, 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 that 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 sort of theme is going to bring us to the final part of the repetition which is Another round of al Khait, and we come across the words again. Slach, what key? Slach la no mechala no kapela no key no amecha veyata like no. There'd be um, a few more paragraphs. There are a few more paragraphs where we um, tap our chest, right, just over where the heart is. This is a very emotional um, type service. But the tapping of the heart being an emotional service still does not permit us to ignore the mind. So we think and we feel as we go through the vidui process of al khait and we think about the things that we've done wrong, and again, we're still very much focusing on the ruach, the emotional capacity of the soul. <laughs> Um, I can't help myself. You know, if we were in Spirit Grow together, you know you'd be getting a whole lot of just uh, ADD ideas or spiritual ideas. <laughs> but um, as we were singing our Shamlu, it almost sounded beautiful, but it's a confession piece. It's like we've stolen, we've done things wrong. And uh, we've got Zaman on guitar and he's harmonizing so beautifully to, it's like saying, 
I have killed, I have stolen, I have slandered, I have slaughtered. It is all these horrible things. And uh, I suppose on the one hand, it's beautiful to have music in shul. It is beautiful. and I, I do love it. And it does elevate, um, but it actually also can mask the true meaning. Sometimes that craving of a beautiful musical spiritual experience can actually mask the true meaning of the prayer. Um, it's not one that really warrants harmony, uh, but because we do have to pick up our spirits, we're doing this in a, in a simulated way we can. But it was just very interesting how it became a beautiful piece of music, even though it's such a harsh paragraph about uh, uh, um, digging deep into the parts of us that really need uh, uh, um, to be worked on. So just a, a interesting little Interesting interpretation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I say that so that no one ever says, but Menachem, why do we have music in shul? Now you know why. It, it covers over the truth. It's beautiful. Right. But uh, it's like, uh, it's, it talks about the lips of truth. The lips of truth are the lips that we have. But the lips of truth are actually just the most outer part of truth itself. Truth is inside. Then you pay lip service to truth. So music is lips, lip service to, to, to spirituality. But there's something I think also, I mean, forget about the fact that we're doing it with a guitar, but the, the tune that we use for Oshamnu is, is something that we've been doing for a, a while. It's an older type oh, of yeah. tune. And even in that, it's something that... It's, there's a bit of an uplifting sense to it or something. There's, it's more, you could maybe interpret that as, as, as a, a sense of, of awe as well. You know, we use a similar tune when we bow down for Elenu. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And, I th and you mentioned last night talking about the fact that there's, like a, there's the personal transgression and the personal teshuva or the reflection that has to be done. And then there's also this sense of a communal responsibility yeah. that we all have. Yeah. And I feel that perhaps, you know, because a lot of these terms might not be fully relevant to us on an individual level. And as you said, they could be relevant to someone, therefore it's relevant to us. Yeah. But I think that it's almost comforting in the sense that there's a collective that, that's chanting together in shul and, and that whole experience. Where yeah, we're, and where doing we're, it out loud. And we're raising others with us. And yes. I, and I think that m maybe there's something about that melody where we're saying, you know, let us be comforted in, in that fact. And it's like what Moshe says. Uh, Moshe says, I mean, this is Moses who's leading a Jewish people through the desert and they keep stuffing up and making mistakes and offending God. And he says, there are 600,000 people and I'm amongst them. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't see himself as a leader apart from them, but rather he's in. And, and actually the greatest way for a community to grow is when we consider everyone a part of our community. Mm. Um, if it's like, well, he's done something wrong and she's doing that. I'm all right. Or I've done this. You're not going to grow. But when we can be vulnerable together, we can grow together. Wow. al -chait. We'll just do one, uh, one al -chait with the al -kulam. The next few pages, as you read in the Machsa, really focus on this day, the day of Yom Kippur, and there are a whole lot of different themes. Um, the day which we ask Hashem to forget, the, the day that we ask Hashem to forgive, the day that we uh, um, beseech Hashem, we ask Hashem. And then we get, actually get this uh, paragraph, which I just was referring to earlier. Uh, it says, it's a day on which the humble Moses pleaded with you on our behalf. And now we can understand um, the, the, the humility of Moses was not that he uh, spoke down about himself. He wasn't self-deprecating, but rather he says there are 600,000 people and I am amongst them. And he says to God, I am whatever you don't like in them. I'm a part of that. And that is a great humility to be able to say, I am together with all people. I'm not just part of, a, of the best dimension. Mm -hmm. And that brings us to the, the end of the repetition of the Amidah, which uh, would normally finish with, a com with, the, with the opening of the Ark once again and the singing of Avinu Malkainu. We'll do the Nigun this time because we did the, the traditional last one for the last service. And we'll oscillate because there will be more Avinu Malkainu's Throughout our simulated oh, service. So many of you volcanoes. <laughs> they really are. <laughs>
where we say our father our king do it for the sake of those who were slain for your holy name and it's a very powerful of where we're saying for those who were killed in the name of being Jewish and if you think throughout Jewish history not uh, the people who've been killed there's been, it's been rather non-discriminatory they could be observant non-observant from a long line of well-known uh, Jewish sages and from a family who no one really knew anyone in the family and what we're saying is, we're all able to be slain. It's happened in our history. We're all in that boat. We accept each other. We accept the Jewishness of each other. We, we, I'm a Jew and the, the next Jew is a Jew, whether, whoever we are. And just as we accept them, we're asking Hashem to accept us. You know, some of the greatest heroes in Jewish history have not necessarily been observant. And some of the greatest history, uh, heroes of Jewish history have been ultra-Orthodox. It's, it's that soul that burns within each one of us that we're asking Hashem to recognize on this day of Yom Kippur. Today is, uh, well, not today, but the day of Yom Kippur will be Thursday. Chamishi. The, Yom Chamishi, and therefore there is the Levite's uh, song. In the temple, you'll notice there were two types of services. A very vocal, loud service, like that of the Levite, and then a very private, concealed, quiet service, that of the Kohen. Kohenim and Levim actually <laughs> reminds me of a, of a Broadway song. Kohenim and Levim should be friends. Anyway, so the Levim, <laughs> Kohenim, take off their shoes. Levim like to sing the blues, and that's why they should always be friends. Anyway, so um, the Levim are a very <laughs> extroverted form of spiritual service, and the Kohenim are a very introverted form of spiritual service. So we have the song of the Levites. This is what they would sing every Thursday in the Mishkan and in the temple, um, and that can be found on 195. That would then have Ludovic Eshemayri, and then there'd be a mourner's Kaddish, um, which of course we're not going to say because neither Zawa nor I are mourning. And also, one can't do the mourner's Kaddish without a minion present. And I know how hard that is for, for many, many people. And as I said on the Rosh Hashanah simulation, just think about um, uh, uh, um, the dynamic of eating a meal together with other people versus eating a meal but looking at each other on Zoom. That dynamic we call Shechina. It's a presence of Hashem. And that can only be... When that is present is the only time we can say Kaddish. You need a quorum in order to create that vibe. And therefore the Kaddish requires that. It's, it's not just about ticking a box. And I know that for many people Kaddish is very cathartic. And, and, and we're not going to have it. And I, I feel for you. I really do. I, I've seen a lot of people struggling because of the lack of having that uh, process in their life. We're going to move to uh, a part which we're just going to sing because we, we would normally open the Ark and we'd take the Torah out, the Sifri Torah actually, multiples, and we'll just sing some of the songs just because they are familiar. Vayahibin <laughs> 
Baruch Shenasan Tara Le'amoy Yisrael B'Kdush Asatoy Hashem, Hashem K'Rachum V'Chanun Erech Apayim V'Rav Chesed V'Yemes Noitze Chesed L'Alofim of course, on Yom Kippur, you'll, you'll sing that three times. We only did it twice. And then the Torah would come out and uh, would be taken around. Everyone could kiss it. And we'd then read the, the Torah portion. Then we'd finish that. I'd probably do a sermon at this at this, at that point. And then Zalman would come back up for the paragraph Hinnity, which is the chazan really um, going through this uh, um, prayer, a chant, if you will, of just laying out his credentials. And that is his credentials of humility, which is why he's willing to stand on behalf of the community as the leader of the service of the Musaf, which brings us now to the Musaf Amida, and you can turn to that. I am going to ask Zalman just to sing the last four lines of the Hinnani um, section because those four lines spell out the Hebrew name Vashem, Yud and He and Vav and He, when you take the first letter of each paragraph. But also, they are very, very powerful words, and the tune is very, very powerful. It really stirs a lot, um, a lot of memory and and. Uh, Nostalgia in a very good way um, within people. So I'll ask Zalman just to pick up from your dati. This is now the third Amidah of Yom Kippur, the first being in the evening, the second in the morning, and then we have the late morning, early afternoon Amidah of Musaf. And this now corresponds to the third level of soul. 
which is the neshama. Neshama has the same root as the Hebrew word neshima, which is breath. But where does breath take place? Is within the head, the nose, the mouth, and then the lungs. And so neshama is the part of the soul that animates our head, which is the seat of consciousness. And so as you move into the al and the Ashamnos of the Musaf Amidah, we're now focusing on uh, um, wrongs that we may have committed using our mind. Now that could be planning, it could be thinking or anticipating to do something wrong, or it could even be entertaining uh, doing something wrong. It could be uh, um, things that we do wrong visually or with our ears. These are very much uh, um, uh, um, things that, that require the mind to process the information. And so it's possible that the part of our soul that is responsible for cognitive ability also needs a tick on, also needs to go through a process of confession and, and exploration of improvement. And so I'll let you uh, once again choose a color that you would associate with um, correcting the way we think and, and upgrading the way we think. Uh, um, and then close your eyes and you say, Baruch Ata Hashem, and you bend and you draw down that energy, allow that color to fill you. This is the color of change and returning on an intellectual level. Ba'al kula melakas lechais Slach lano mechalano Kapelano Now, we're not reading the, the silent Amidah, and so Zalman will uh, um, guide us through some of the Musaf repetition, and interestingly, although it is a very, very long repetition, a lot of it is actually done reading to oneself, um, or, or in Spirigo I'd be explaining things. Um, there are very few songs, and so it won't take very, very long at all, comparatively, and that's, it's, it's, it's somewhat ironic. But we will move through some of the popular features, and some of the important parts that I'd like you to be aware of, even though we don't have the full uh, um, experience of being together in shul. So, Zaman, where would you like us to pick up with the repetition of the Amidah? Well, I think we can do a, maybe an abridged sort of just introduction yep. just to get us back in that zone. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then um, there are a couple um, songs that we would use some of the generic tunes yet again, depending on what we'd be doing that year. Uh, but then really the main next meetup point would be at the uh, Sanatokov. So let's do that. Zalman will, will guide us through the tunes of the Chazan's introduction to the repetition. <laughs> Ata gibawa wor leila madoshem 
We'll do a bit of a different one for this one. Please. A bit of a uh, Galiziana, uh, old oh. school. Pages, it has a, a repeat theme that we had in the morning, which was the Imul Elikim, it's the word of Hashem, and Elikim, and then Master Elikano, this is the work of our God. And th- th- in the morning service, I focus on the difference between Imra, which is the spoken word, and Master, the action. I now want to just focus momentarily on these two different names of God, Elikim, which is God, and Elikano, which is our God. But they're actually very different words, Elikim and Elikano. Uh, 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 completely different words. Elohim, actually, if you take the numerical value of that name of God, and you'd find the numerical value of each of the Hebrew letters, it comes out to 86, which is the same as the numerical value as the Hebrew word Hateva, which is nature. So Elohim is Hashem manifesting within nature. Nature is an expression of Hashem in the form of Elohim. Elokeinu means our God, which means as Hashem flows through us, this has nothing to do with nature. This is the animation of the human, the animation of us, which is our soul. So we've got Imrul Elikim, the spoken word of nature, Mas Elikino, the work of, of our soul. And so now we find this depth within the paragraphs where not only is it about spoken word versus action, Hashem speaks, speaks and the word comes to be, um, Hashem forms and, and, and everything is a product, product of his action, but actually the different energies of Hashem that are vested in reality. Um, we meet up for Unasana Tokef, which is in every Machzor, and uh, this is the famous piece that I spoke about in the Rosh Hashanah recording. We speak every year about Rav, Av- Rav Amram of Mainz, Germany, who was tortured uh, when he refused to, to convert to Catholicism. And um, this is a piece that he uh, uh, composed, just intuitively came out in his dying hours of life. And then his colleague in Frankfurt, uh, uh, Kleinimus, would then go on, have a dream, and uh, wake up and record the prayer. And it has moved into the liturgy across Machzom all around the world. And so Zaman will pick it up, and then we'll move into Beresh Hashanah, uh, which follows on, which is uh, uh, the famous piece, uh, um, of who will live and who will die. Uh, you can think about the Leonard Cohen song and that, that very deep voice and, and uh, style that he has, which really does stir something very deep within us. Uh, but Zalman's going to sing um, a more Jewish traditional tune that we're familiar with. And so he'll take us from Unasana Tokev into Beresh Hashanah. Oh. 
Through change and through humility and through charity, change and returning to who we are, Teshuva, to fill a prayer, which is actually a process of ego abnegation and becoming humble within the context of the infinite's existence, and then stock, which is charity, to be able to discover the infinite. Uh, um, soulful capacity within everyone and then to feel for them and then give and provide those are the things when we go through that sort of change that changes everything about the paragraph that we're just saying whether you have a good or bad uh, um, um, sentence so to speak uh, meted out by Hashem at the end of Yom Kippur all that changes when we go through change Zalman will take us through a more uplifting Polish Hasidic tune that we sing every year. <laughs> Let's do it. Ein Kitzva. Ein Kitzva lish no sech of ye ein kat. Le oirech yamecha. Ve ein lejaer makavos kodecha. Ve ein lefarush elum shmecha. Shimcha noeh. The service then takes a break. We move into the Kedusha and then 
we fire back up with v'chom aminim, that we all believe, we all believe. And it's an interesting idea, because do we all believe? And the answer is, kinda. We all have the capacity to believe. We all have the capacity to believe. Uh, um, Jewish people describe as maminim b'nei maminim. We are believers, the children of believers. And uh, Epigenetically, as you would uh, yeah, I do like previously. I do like to talk about the epigenetics of belief. And uh, um, this idea of being believers, I, I, I was about to say, I believe. I think that this idea of being believers explains the itchy feet that Jewish people have. We're, we're, we're people that are restless. We, we seek, we search, we travel, we move around. And we're never satisfied. There's, we're, we're, it's, it's not because we can't be satisfied. It's because we are constantly looking for something deeper. We believe there is a depth and we want to get to it. And that, I believe, uh, explains the itchy feet syndrome of the, of the Jewish spirit. Yeah, that, you could talk about that. We could talk about that for many, many hours, probably. So is there a particular tune that you want us to sing with Choma Minim before we transition? We've done, we've done a few classics uh, in the past. How about this one? V'chol ma'aminim she'u ke'l emuna Ha'boi chen o'voi de'i gintzei nistaros V'chol ma'aminim she'u boi chen k'loyos Ha'goi yomim ha'ves o'voi de'i mishachas V'chol ma'aminim she'u Ga'el chazak Ha'adon yechidi Le'voi e'yoylam V'chol ma'aminim she'u So normally the chazan would um, finish that blessing and uh, the service would take a sudden shift uh, because now we move, the Yom Kippur service moves into the service of the high priest and the, and the priest in general in the temple on uh, Yom Kippur. And um, much of the next part of davening focuses on that. And uh, I just, I'll just run you through it, that basically high priests were not always the most learned people. And so therefore in the week in the lead up, but they, they more often than not were hopefully pious people. So in the week in the lead up to Yom Kippur, they'd sit with the temple rabbinate, who would then train them and make sure that they were fully aware of the full service. And this does have some political overtones because in the Second Temple period, there were a lot of factions, political factions, and political factions were linked to religious factions. And religious factions were not power brokers. They actually differed in how specific things of the temple service um, should be performed. So th this is quite a, a, a deep rift. And so the temple rabbinate would try to ensure that the high priest will follow the rabbinical interpretation of how the temple service would, would take place. So they would train him up for a week before. And then throughout the course of the, the, the evening and the morning of Yom Kippur, the high priest would change into different clothes. Um, he would bring different sacrifices. He himself would actually bring the sacrifice. He'd shech the animal and he'd sprinkle the blood at different points. There'd be intentions and meditations because the blood is the carrier of the soul. And the animals represent life in this world. It wasn't just about sacrificing for the sake of sacrificing, which is why, as I said earlier, Isaiah says, stop the sacrifices. I don't want them if they're not coming with the purpose that they were designed. Mm. It's not just routine of killing animals, sprinkle blood, put them on the altar, burn the incense. No, it's a very, very ritualistic process. And I, I think that the reason why we don't have it today is because we would probably just do it as some sort of rote ritual instead of a deeply spiritual process that should lead to a national transition of behavior mm. um, but that's not for now um, so the the cone would go back and forth and he'd immerse himself in the temple mikveh in the in the pool and he'd come out and be wearing white and then he'd change into his gold and colorful vestments and there was there was this whole routine and the different colored clothes would put him in different mindsets and he would walk through the process and then towards late morning um, he'd cast lots and one goat would be sent to, uh, uh, to be pushed off a cliff in the desert that would be known as the Azazel. The scapegoat. The scapegoat. And then you had the other goat which was brought up as a sacrifice in the, in the temple. And there was a whole process of the, the Kohanim um, along a 20 plus kilometer route from the Judean desert to the temple signaling with flags that, uh, the, the, that the, the goat had been pushed off 
in the desert so that the high priest could carry on with his service because there's no technology. And uh, they'd be in these little bursikis and these little uh, sukkah huts. And they actually, they were the only people who had ready jugs of water ready for them on Yom Kippur um, that, because it was critical that as soon as that happened in the desert, 20-something kilometers away, that the, the temple service continued. So you just think about the, the speed of light and the waving of a flag was how long it took for the message to travel from the desert back to the temple that the wow. sacrifice had been brought. And then he carries on and uh, um, uh, um, the, the service would be performed. And there are two songs, that, three songs actually, that I'd like Zalman to lead us through. One is V'kach Omer, which is, this is what... Uh, would be counted as the priest would sprinkle the blood. And then, uh, and it, was, it wasn't just sprinkling, there was like this flicking action. And then the koyanim, the koyanim, all the priests and the Jewish people who were gathered in the, in the wider, larger courtyard of the temple, they would, they would then see the high priest come out and he would, he would say the name of God and everyone would bow. It was this incredible um, experience. And if we were in shul, we would actually bow. We'd go right down onto our knees and fall on our face and place our hands in front of us. Some would then even extend and lie flat in a true hishtachavah, in a true form of submit, submissive bowing. What's the, the third one? I want to know if it's the same one as that, that I intended to do. Um, the third song that I'd like us to sing is Mari Koyen. Oh, okay. Is that what you were intending? I, I wanted to whip out a little achas v'yachas. Oh, that's, that's the first. For Kachoy Omer. Then Vahakoyanim yeah, yeah, we'll, and uh, we'll Marakoyan. We'll... So I have just moved through what is called the service of Yom Kippur, which is the temple service. And Zaman will now lead us through uh, a few songs that we would actually, a few chants that we'd sing multiple times um, as we read through the intervals of what I've just described. Yeah, and again, we're switching as far as the Nusach and the, uh, the vibe or the tune from the Chazan takes another shift and it sort of resembles... What, we're, what Menachem has been talking there's, about. There's quite, yeah, you'll hear it. There's quite an awe and uh, this, it's almost like this trumpeting of the moment because that's what Yom Kippur was. It was a very powerful moment and uh, you'll get that in the V'kachoy Omer. V'kachoy Omer Ano Hashem Chotos Yovisi Poshati Lefanecha Ani Yovisi Ano Hashem Kaper No Lechato Yim Lavoy Nois Lav Shem Shkoshu Vashi 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 Lefanecha Ani Yovisi Kako Zobay Zorash Mavdech Mikovdech Okiv Yom Azei Chabar Lechem Tarek Semek Chochad Zeichem so the high priest would, would announce, he'd say, and this is what I'd say, O oh God, your people, the house of Israel, we have sinned and we've committed iniquity and have transgressed before you. I beseech you for the sake of your ineffable name, grant atonement for the sins, iniquities and transgressions of which your, the, your people, the house of Israel, have sinned, committed and transgressed, as it is written in the Torah of Moses, of Moses your servant, in your glorious name, for on this day, atonement shall be made for you to purify you of all your sins before the Lord. So just imagine the high priest who, who sees himself as being the most important spiritual leader on the day, trying to invoke some sort of rachmanistic energy, some sort of compassionate energy, and recognizing we've done things wrong. Hashem, please bless us for another year. And there'd be three different times during the service where um, everyone would bow down. And like we do that in, uh, in, in Shul as well, in Yom Kippur. And before the last time, you mentioned, alluded to the sprinklage of the blood, seven times of this flicking motion. Yeah. And he would chant out this, and I think... Uh, this, is, and this is what he would count. When they would hear the holy name. <laughs> Ya 
ay, 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 in a complete state of purity, and they'd bow. They fall on their face and they'd say, Baruch Shem Kavod Machoto Lolam Vaed. Blessed is the holy name of Hashem, and his kingdom should last forever. Hence that idea of the name of Hashem, that the impact of Hashem is what exists in the kingdom, in the physical universe. That would um, happen a, a, a series of times throughout the day, and then the day would build up. And the high priest would take a pan of incense, and he'd walk in for the annual uh, um, um, step into the Holy of Holies. In the, fir- in the Mishkan, in the first temple, inside the Holy of Holies was the Ark with the cherubs. In the second uh, temple, the Ark was not present. It had gone into hiding. It had been put into hiding, I should say, um, towards the end of the first temple, and it was not recovered. It remains in hiding ever since. Um, but he would still walk in. The high priest would still walk in with this smoking uh, pan of, of, of incense. Now, it was very possible that the high priest would collapse uh, in, in the Holy of Holies. Um, it was a very awe uh, inspiring moment and a high priest could even die on the day and he'd actually go in with a chain around his leg so that if the chain stopped moving and he'd stop moving no one had to go in to get him but they could pull him out because no one else was allowed in sometimes the high priest would die during the year if he was not um, worthy of of the position that he held and in the second temple period there were over 200 high priests in a four, just over 400 year period so wow. there was a high turnover at one point there were people who were taking the job even though they weren't fit but when he came out in the first temple, think about Aaron, think about the Mishkan, think about the first 800 years of Jewish peoplehood after Sinai, and even the, the initial years and even the, the Maccabee years of the second temple, the high priest goes into the Holy of Holies, the whole nation collectively draws their breath, and then he emerges and he has this massive glow on his face. And this is the piece that finishes the temple service of the Yom Kippur prayers, and this is what we sing every year at Spirit Grove, describing the face of the high priest. I just love it. It says like he would come out and his face would be like the lightning that flashes from the effulgence of the angels. That was the appearance of the Cohen, like the iridescent appearance of the rainbow in the midst of the clouds. Wow. These are very beautiful metaphors. And if we were in shul, we'd finish that song and then you'd feel a sudden heaviness come onto the service because the next part is called Slichot. And in that, we actually um, recount, amongst other things, uh, some of the greatest tragedies in Jewish history, which uh, um, the Medrash Eicha, the Medrash is the allegorical part of, of Jewish teaching. And what it does is it strings together a series of different historical events and tells it as a story that takes place on a single day or in a single week. 
And uh, what it does is it takes a series of stories that takes place over a hundred year period of Roman rule where the Romans persecuted the Jewish people of Israel and hunted down all the sages. And it goes through this process of, of, uh, of Caesar asking the rabbis what is the punishment for the brothers who sold their, their brother into slavery, referring to Joseph. And they say that uh, it should be put to death. And he says, well, in the absence of them being put to death, I'm going to put you to death. And this part of the service talks about the torture of uh, the great sages, who you can find their names throughout the, the Talmud. These are the great sages and how each one is tortured. And it's, and it's absolutely, uh, um, it, it's gory and it's, it's, it's horrible. Faces being flayed off and people being burnt um, with, with piles of, of, uh, of wet wool on their chest. It's really, really quite um, excruciating to read. And the reason why we read it is because we think about the human sacrifices um, that have taken place. And the period of Rome and that period of Jewish history is uh, one that uh, um, things weren't great amongst the Jewish people. We, we turned on each other. And so we think about the links between some of the torture and the pain, as well as um, the, 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 the torture and pain that we brought on ourselves through the, the, the poor behavior, the lack of love that existed amongst all of us. And so we, we, we don't normally link tragedy to bad things, but when the Talmud does, we, we, we accept it. And so on Yom Kippur, we don't just think about things that we've done wrong, but we think about the implications of the things that we do wrong and how it actually can impact someone else. These are great sages. They did nothing wrong. What did, what did they do to, to, to merit um, uh, uh, um, being tortured? But actually, as representatives of the people, they actually bear... The, the, the punishment of the people. And so we, we don't want to think about in guilty, like what punishment are we incurring on others, but rather the fact that we are responsible for each other and we are responsible for our behaviours. And once again, we have this Chotonu Tzureinu, Slachlonu Yitzreinu, Hashem, please pardon us. Chotonu Tzureinu, Slachlonu Yitzreinu. And that brings us all the way to the end of this part of the service where we have once again... The, the, the song of bring us to the Temple Mount, we'd like to be there. And, and if you think about it, the placing of that song, I'd like to be on Temple Mount, I'd like to be together with the Jewish people, I'd like to be in a, in a, in a world that we're all together. That, um, that coming at the end of this, the idea that the temple was destroyed, the idea that our sages have been killed, the, the fact that, that throughout history we may have done things wrong, we're now experiencing regret and a desire for something more. Now, how do we get to something more? Is through working together. When we are going to build a temple through love, when we are going to build a temple through t connectivity and through acceptance, then we will actually come to be able to pray in that temple. The ark would be closed and we'd finish the service with the al-chait, 
We don't even get all the final songs for this service. We finish kind of hanging. We finish with like, okay, what? And we're just left there. And that last part that we, we read is the al Khaits, the Ashamnu, and the al Kulam. And remember, we're still in the repetition of the Musaf Amidah, so this is the al Khait that corresponds to things that we may have done wrong using our mind. Um, and so we think about that as we say the al Khaits, and we think about what are areas that we need to make change in our life so that we're not using our mind to do things that are negative, but rather things that are positive. Zalman would then um, finish reading the, the repetition of the Amidah and we'd have the priests, the Kohenim of the community, come up and stand in front of the Ark and they'd then bless us. And that would uh, be the conclusion of the service. So Zalman will just give us a few of the keys of the Kohenim. Zalman's not a Kohen, I'm not a Kohen, but at least the tune hey, what, can help what, what us. What do I know? Ay We'd finish the Birchas Koenim with that calling out together and in the book of life, blessing, peace and prosperity, deliverance, consolation, favorable decrees. May we and all the people of the house of Israel be remembered and inscribed before you for a happy life and for peace. As it is said, for through me shall your days be multiplied and the years of life be added to you. Inscribe us for a happy life, O living God. Inscribe us in the book of life as it is written. And you who cleave to Hashem, your God, will all, are all alive today. that niggins called Reblavik's niggin we finished the service with that and uh, just like that it comes to an end there's no enkelokeno or leno that will do at the end of Ne'ila and that will be at the end of our next simulated service this concludes the morning simulated service of Yom Kippur and I look forward to you joining me for the simulated Ne'ila service which will be the fifth service of Yom Kippur. We're not going to do a Mincha one um, uh, because it's it's fairly uh, self-understood. It's it's a micro version of the things that we've done this morning and last night. So I'll see you for the Ne'ila service and um, hoping that that will really provide all the oomph that you need before you go into Yom Kippur. It's like we can almost uh, uh, live with this idea of the end is wedged in the beginning. Before Yom Kippur's even begun, we're going to be have finished the whole Ne'ila service. And hopefully we'll have the blessings that we get at the end of Ne'ila already prior to even Kol Nidre happening. Amen. I look forward to you joining us for the next recording. We'll see you soon.